I started studying or became a theologian, I had never heard the word theology. In my, before, actually, I had not, and that's the truth, before college. And then when people started talking about theology, it sounded to me like philosophy. Who does that? <laughs> <laughs> but then I came to understand. The words of a 10th century theologian who knew that I'd be quoting Anselm that said, theology is faith seeking understanding. Faith seeking understanding. Trying to understand the claims, the meaning, if not the reason for our faith in the context of us trying to navigate the realities of our living. Theology at its best is not abstract thought that you come to and say, I have nothing better to do today, so huh, I wonder what God's justice looks like. <laughs> That's not how it happens. It happens when we are wrestling with questions of our faith, when we are in the middle of a context of injustice. And then we ask ourselves, how in the world do I maintain a faith in a, in the, in a just God? What, what does God's love, what is the meaning of a God that we call love in the midst of a context where all we recognize and feel and experience is hate? That's theology. Faith seeking understanding. Always born out of the context out of which we're trying to navigate our faith. And so for me, I have been trying to navigate my faith in the realities of a world where black lives don't seem to matter. In the reality of a world where racial injustice and inequity and inequality has seemed to become the watchword. Faith and hope will see together. Christians are inextricably, intrinsically related. And so when I thought about what to say to you today, I, I said, I've got to start with my own journey. My own trying to understand, yes, the meaning of faith, trying, trying to hang on to hope in the midst of crucifying realities of racial injustice. <laughs> and so that's what I want to hopefully share with you this morning and see if we can move through the despair of crucifixion to a hope for new, what I call in my most recent work, Resurrection. So let me take you through my journey of faith, seeking understanding. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows my sorrow. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Glory. journey, this journey of hope renewed has to start in the midst of understanding the realities of living on the edge of hopelessness and despair. And so it began, oh, this, it really worked, so I went too fast. <laughs> it begins in crucifying reality. And when we speak of crucifying realities, we speak of the cross. You know, I always often say, Bishop Kevin has probably heard me say before, we, we come.
come from a faith tradition that has a crucifixion at its center. And it's time we take that seriously. And to take that seriously is to understand even more that it's not simply a crucifixion, it's a crucifixion of an incarnate God. Two things, a faith tradition with an incarnate God and a crucifixion, a God that has entered into history. So we are called to understand the realities of the cross in our own social historical context because to understand that is to understand our God who is incarnate always moves through history. Seems to me sometimes we just don't take that seriously, even though that's the center of our faith, but I'm just saying. <laughs> I live that reality. It's into that reality that I seek to understand my faith. And so what is that reality? Nationwide, black people have died, this is from COVID, at 1.4 times the rate of white people. These statistics were updated uh, March 2021. Some of you probably know them through the CDC, uh, 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 the COVID tracking project. It comes out of Boston. I won't read them all, you can s sit with it, but that's the headline. And we can see that people of color in general are dying from COVID at a rate significantly higher than that of white people, those raised white. The rate of fatal police shootings in the United States shows large differences, I don't need to tell you this, based on ethnicity. Black people are likely to be twice as likely, twice as likely to be killed by police. Than those raised white. Twice as likely. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Recent data. Read, I, I, I uh, commend to all of you the National Urban League State of America was just released April 28th. Some basic realities. A black child is being expected to live only up to 74.7 years, which is four years less than a white child. That's a lot. That's the black mortality rate. Black women are 59% more likely to die from childbirth. This is what, we, what we're talking about racism in the medical profession. Black women, 30% more likely to die of uh, breast cancer. Black men, 52% more likely to die of prostate cancer. This has to do with medical racism. You know, it's nothing like going to a doctor and not thinking that they're going to believe that you're in pain. Because that's that happens. You know, I was very intentional, very intentional. When I uh, was expecting my now 29-year-old son, I was calling him 28 yesterday, but it's like, you know, <laughs> kid. and now you, now you take your children's age down lower because that makes you older, right? <laughs> but I remember when I was expecting Desmond, I was very clear that I was going to have a black female OBGYN. Because I didn't feel like dealing 
with anyone that was non-black telling me it don't hurt that much. <laughs> really. And not believing. That's, that's, that's. You're reading about it all the time now. But that's been the experience of black people before all of a sudden people said, oh, that happens. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows. Mm -hmm. And then there's this. Now, you know, I didn't tell you this was going to be a comfortable talk because the road <laughs> to, to, to hope ain't comfortable. You got to go through the crucifying realities of hopelessness. Yeah. And if you look like me, you got to deal with this. Amen. And here's the despair. This is the despair. If, if all the rest wasn't enough, then you got good white Christians with the crucifixion at their center voting for a vision and supporting a vision of America that everyone knew. Come on. Was xenophobic. was bigoted, stood over and against the very values we claim to support. And we all, everyone's like, oh yeah, we knew what them evangelicals were going to do. But here's the news. Yeah, they did their thing. But so did 60% of white Catholics, and so did over 50% of non-evangelical white Protestants. The majority of white Christian America supported a vision that is an anathema to a faith tradition with a cross at the center. And so I never thought it would happen to me. I didn't. I found myself, I love movies. I love movies. But I found myself not being able and not interested in watching black films. Films that centered black life and black reality. And I, I, I watch all movies and I'm particularly drawn to black movies. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. I found myself wondering, with my son, who kept asking me the question, and by the way, still keeps asking me the question. He was asking it the other day. Will black lives ever really matter in this country? I didn't think it would happen to me. But I found myself experiencing the reality of racial trauma. Racial trauma. The cumulative effect of racism on someone's mental and physical health. This is what the, the therapists, black therapists tell us. But I want to add something more to that that they don't talk about but it's just as profound and clear and, and other now black faith leaders and black theologians and others of us are talking about it. It's not only the accumulative effect on your mental and physical health, but on your spiritual health. Mm -hmm. It includes, and I don't have to read this, you can sit with it, Direct acts of racism as hate crimes are being discriminated against at work, systemic racism, health disparity, all these things I just told you about. As well as microaggressions. I don't even know. You know what? Microaggressions. They're only micro to the people who aggress, not to the people who are yes. being aggressed against. Yes. We just figure out how to deal with it so you don't have a macro reaction. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the thing. We talk about 
the legacy of slavery, which I like to say is really the legacy of white supremacy. And we talk about that legacy usually systemically and structurally, right? We rarely talk about that legacy uh, epistemologically, how we think. We rarely talk about that legacy, the psychological legacy, the spiritual legacy, the legacy that is the trauma. The past is the present. And it gets handed down through generations. Mm -hmm. And it accumulates. Psychologists and the medical profession, what is it, the AMA and all that, they're now really, really talking about it. Because they recognize that something happened during COVID for the Wider society, wider, not whiter, but, yeah. but for wider, I have a sense of humor. You got to laugh and keep crying. Come on. But for wider society, COVID laid bare these realities of racial inequities. For those who have been experiencing it, it deepened it. Didn't lay it bare. It was a cumulative impact. It's like, really, God? He was already dying at a, uh, at, at a disproportionate rate. And now COVID and that's going, can't we have something that they get that we don't get? <laughs> <laughs> So, I didn't, and I mean this, I didn't think it would happen to me. But it did. And I found myself not being able to breathe. And I mean it. I'm a priest. I've been black for 65 years. Thought it was, you know, you just laugh to keep from crying and you keep on moving. And sometimes you want to take a little mental health break and just stay home for the day. <laughs> I've done that. But I didn't think I'd find myself in this place on the edge of hopelessness where I literally felt like I couldn't breathe, and I'm serious. I didn't want to hear anything more about it. I know that wider society just kept wanting to see George Floyd. Oh, but I didn't want to see no more of that. I didn't want to hear no more of that. It's not that it wasn't important. I just couldn't take it in. And with the son saying, oh no, there will never be a time, he said, when black lives matter. Black hope, this was from a op-ed, today is less patient. That's what I see with my son's generation. The demand is that the long arc of the moral universe bend down now. And here's the thing, here's the thing. When we get to this point, and this is what I heard in, in my son's consistent questioning on this matter, where we, when we say that will black lives ever really matter, we're really asking another question here. We're asking, and this is sort of out of order. Hmm. Is God a white racist? That's the question. Because what we're asking about is if our lives really matter to God. James Baldwin once said that every black person comes, has this time in their lives when they face the shock 
that the country for which they have pledged allegiance and the flag to which they have pledged allegiance has not pledged allegiance to them. I didn't think it would have to be, but I was facing the shock and wondering whether or not the God to which I had given my faith was indeed faithful to me, to black life. W.E.B. Du Bois, line from W.E.B. Du Bois' poem, uh, Litany, a Litany of Atlanta, Atlanta Litany, I can't, I'm getting it wrong, but it's a litany to Atlanta. And one of the lines is, what meaneth this? Tell us the plan, give us the sign, keep not thou silent, O God. I had forgotten all about that poem until I found myself not even on the edge of hopelessness, but hopeless. Hopeless. Here's the thing about hope. Christian hope is that hope is grounded first in a vision. It is grounded in the vision that things the way they are is not simply the way they are supposed to be, but it's, it's more than that. It's that things the way they are is not the way they're going to be. It's grounded in the vision that allows us to have faith. And that is the promise of God. Martin Luther King said, I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. Now, why do you know that? He didn't know that because there anything going on around him. He knew that because he, of his faith, because he really, really believed in the promise of God. He believed in the gospel good news. He believed in what Jesus came here to tell us about and to move us toward. Jesus wasn't really saying, believe in me, believe in me. Jesus was saying, believe in the promise of God. And that is the promise of a more just future. You know, where the last are first and the first are last, but not because there's a reversal of fortune, but because the first are last and the last are first, there's no difference. Everyone is treated as the equal, sacred children of God that they are. So ain't no first and last, everybody saying. That's God's more just future. So that's the promised land, right? That King was talking about. The King believed it. He, he knew he wasn't getting there with it. I, I'm looking around there. I might not get there with you, Desmond, but you know, I believe. Now, if you really believe, then that's what allows you to have faith. Because faith is about partnering with God in moving toward that vision. An act of faith is almost to me the second step. Because the first step is really believing. Maybe the first step is God revealing the vision. And if you really believe, then you partner with God and moving toward that vision. Because if you don't believe that it's possible, why do anything? You know, just roll your rock up the hill and keep on going. <laughs> so, so check this out then. That means that faith 
isn't about doctrine, isn't about loyalty tests to some dogma. It isn't whether or not it's the real presence or the not so real presence or whatever <laughs> the devil's going on in the Eucharist. <laughs> it's not I know, you know. I've, I've been a priest a long time, so I, if I get kicked out the church for this, there we go. <laughs> but it's not. It's about partnering with God because you believe in God's promise. So it's action. You know, our presiding bishop calls us to be a part of the Jesus movement on the way to the beloved community. And I always love it. My Baptist and Methodist friends always say, so what y'all Episcopalians been doing if you wasn't in the Jesus movement? <laughs> it do be a good question. <laughs> but it's what is this institution that calls itself church overall been doing? Because the movement means move. Yes. Yes. You got to move. It was amazing how people were paralyzed about how to be church with the pandemic. They're paralyzed because they didn't know how to get to the altar. But you see, we had been paralyzed before because we didn't know how to get out of the daggone buildings. <laughs> <laughs> and that kind of paralysis brings on hopelessness. So hope, so let's get to hope, let's get to hope. So hope is inextricably related for Christians to faith. Because hope is grounded in two things. <clears throat> the vision and the movement toward the vision. Where there is that vision that is God, and that movement toward it, the two go together. Ah, there you find the seeds for hope. Mm. Mm. Even as, even as, it is the hope that keeps you moving. And so imagine <clears throat> not really believing or trusting the vision because of the depth of the crucifying realities. That's hopelessness. That's despair. So how do, what's the role to hope renewed? If hope, I want to borrow this from uh, the late now sociologist of religion, Peter Berger, who said, hope is a signal of transcendence. It's a signal of transcendence that breaks into our ordinary realities and allows us to know that, ah, there's something more. Not simply there's a transcendent thing that is that there's a transcendent vision that is real. Keep that for a moment. So what's the way back? What was my way back? What is our way back? How do we keep hope going in the midst of crucifying reality? We have to find a way to expand our peoples, our nations, moral imaginary. So that we imagine a world and a society and the meaning of justice not the way we define it. Because I tell you, what we call justice around here don't be looking like justice to me. <laughs> Doesn't feel like it. 
these statistics I just showed you, they ain't going nowhere, they're getting worse. And yet we call that justice. We have to expand our moral imaginary. Defining what justice looks like because we, as people of faith, and, and, and what, I'm not watching the time, so uh, check me on the time. Steve, you go. look at Steve. Steve, five, I got five. Okay, so I'm going to get it done in five. <laughs> I'm supposed to be Episcopalian, not Baptist. I gotta get this going. <laughs> but as people of faith, we are accountable to God's vision. We are accountable not to what people orchestrate and call justice in our present reality. We are not accountable to any in any way, shape, or form to the to the status quo. Period. As I say, end of story, full stop. So we have to expand the moral imaginary as to what justice looks like. We're accountable to the promise of God. And faith leaders, ostensibly accountable to God's just future, have a primary responsibility to lead the way to a more expansive moral imaginary. And see, so you said, what's all this have to do with hope? It's, it's the very foundation of trying to move us out of hopelessness to hope. Because, you know, if I see faith leaders doing what they're supposed to do, if I see a movement, that's, it. that's where hope is found. And then, here we go. I know we can't get black lives to matter. Now we're trying to get black stories to matter. Maybe we can start with black stories matter. Here is why it matters. Black stories do matter. The stories of people who have been on the underside of injustice, I'm out of my context of blackness, they matter. Why do they matter? For two reasons. I'm going quickly. I might go five over. Is that okay, Steve? Uh, 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 here's why, why they matter. You know, Yes, I'll get to this, and it'll uh, amplify the voices, raise awareness, take action. But I really, these stories, because in the stories of the black struggle, you find at least two things. You find a people who are being motivated by a river of hope, to borrow Vincent Harding's metaphor. They are a sign of hope. I've often said that which keeps me going is knowing that I am from a people who fought, never ever imagined that they would be free, never drew a free breath, but fought for freedom anyhow. Now who does that? <laughs> that is a people who really believe in the justice of God, partner with God, and that becomes hope. And if you don't study those stories, guess what? You lose the wisdom. You lose the resilience. You lose that sign of hope. That's where it's found. It's always found. Hope, radical hope, is always found with those people who have the least reason to hope. In crucifying realities. And if you don't know those stories, then you have cut yourself off from the center of our Christian faith. Mm -hmm. And I mean it. Mm -hmm. So it matters. It matters that we talk about things like the 1619 Project. It matters. It is our responsibility. You also find any time that black people or any people who were on the underside of justice, but I talk about this out of my context, any time black people have fought for freedom, guess what? They weren't just fighting for freedom for themselves. They were making the world better, the society better, and they were moving us closer to this vision, maybe an accidental vision, but it's there now, this vision where we said that this nation will be a nation where there's freedom and justice for all. Mm -hmm. May have been an accident, mm -hmm. 
but the rock sung out and it's there. <laughs> and some of us dare to believe it. Hope! Don't be fooled by, yo, oh, can't talk about this because it's divisive. If you don't talk about it, we aren't going to get to where we, as people of faith, claim we're supposed to be. And if ain't nobody else going to do it, it's the responsibility of our institutions that call themselves church to do it. Amen. It always happened. The best of the black church was always filling in the gaps that society created. Mm -hmm. And so, so telling these, my son learned uh, uh, black poets in the church, in my black Episcopal church. They stand up and he quoted, I too am an American by Langston Hughes. I learned it there. Here's the other thing. Hope. If young people are not taught an accurate account of our history, then they have little <coughs> chance of doing better than our generation in enacting racial justice. It's true. Mm -hmm. It'll just be like us. And every time, and really, I've, I, I really am at the point. I don't want to hear another thing in the news about these laws that are being enacted in schools to take out. I can't, I can't. I always say to my sibling, I can't. Because I don't, that takes me to this point of hopelessness, because how, how are we going to get there? I can't. It's important to know the struggles of the people who kept their eyes on the prize. Amen. Because that's where the hope gets renewed. Mm -hmm. I'm moving fast. So, it's also important in our churches to enact the vision. If we believe that all bodies are sacred, then our religious iconography has to show that all bodies are sacred. The only person of color at the Last Supper can't be Judas. <laughs> and we know, I ain't gonna say no more. And all I can say is when that happens, not only is that theologically inaccurate, but it's also historically inaccurate. Just saying. So, Resurrection hope is hope renewed. <clears throat> it's about that which resurrects us to bring us back into partnership with God. Resurrected hope is faith renewed. It's finding that way back to really believing in God's promise. Mm -hmm. So, how was it that I moved from the brink of despair back to hope? and hope renewed. I put on my mask. It's the truth. For people who don't believe us, have got pictures. <laughs> people know. Because here's the thing, people who know me know that I was a germaphobe before COVID. <laughs> <laughs> So I literally didn't go out of my house. My spouse was doing the grocery shopping and I make him come into the garage and change his clothes. This is true. You get me asking the whole nine yards. I Zoomed with Desmond. He lives in Baltimore. I said, stay on over there. <laughs> but I found myself at a place I didn't think I'd be. And so I put on my mask, 
and I went down to Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington, D.C., because I don't live too far from there. And my hope was renewed. <coughs> because there was the protest. And the only reason those people would be there is because they really believed whether or not they were of a faith tradition with the crucified, resurrected Jesus at the center. They were only there risking their lives because they really believed that there would be a day when black lives would matter. And so, no peace. I end where I began with another spiritual. Oh freedom, oh freedom, oh freedom over me. Before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Here's the thing about spirituals. They epitomize. Because spirituals weren't simply about getting over to the promised land in the great by and by. Anyone that knows spirituals, I mean, they, that's what the slaveholders, that's what they thought they did. They ain't no <laughs> it was double coded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When they sang, you know, going over to Canaan land, they meant two things. They sung, the, their, their slaveholders thought, oh, they talking about going to heaven. And so they let them sing. But they were sending messages about freedom on earth. Amen. That's hope. It's being driven and really believing in the Canaan that is God's promise. And letting that drive you toward the Canaan in our reality of living. That's the spirituals. That's hope. And every time they sang, it was hope renewed. I'll stop there.